Hello everyone, welcome to Meaning and History, and today we're talking about ancient empires or these large, expansive, aggressive, and expanding states uh, during the ancient period. And so when you think about Western civilization, you know, with that, that storyline, what we're really talking about uh, oftentimes is the expansion of a couple of major empires that come out of Mesopotamia, out of that area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, modern day Iraq. And those empires included like the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. And then to the west in Iran, those empires are replaced by the Persian Empire. And then new empires emerge in the east, uh, or excuse me, in the west uh, with the um, with the Greeks. And so the Macedonians under Alexander the Great uh, conquers, first of all, you know, the Greek city-states and then expands and, and goes head-to-head -head, uh, with, um, with the Persians and then it goes all the way across to India. And so when we think about these, these states expanding over this large geographical area, I think it's worth thinking about in terms of, of what motivated that. And so that's kind of what I want to frame up for just a, a minute or so. First of all, let's remember that these ancient states start out as cities and the surrounding agricultural hinterland. And that uh, city-state was a, a group of people who were probably from the same tribe. They, they represented the same ethnic group. Um, they were agricultural villages with a, with a, a, a central uh, sort of urban core uh, in which there were temple and government and, and, and maybe some very specialized kind of artisans that lived in those places. Over time, uh, the, the connections between individual cities and neighboring cities begins to create something of a kingdom in which there might be various and sundry related people, but slightly different tribes, and so they form up in sort of a larger state. Uh, those urban economies then began to develop and so there's trade that begins to happen between different cities um, or different city-states and as that begins to grow those um, th that, that trade becomes pretty important in fact these these larger kingdoms begin to depend on the flow of goods back and forth between uh, cities within the region so now we begin to get sort of this regional economy built up so imagine with me if you would that you have a regional economy, that resources are being shared economically uh, through trade uh, between these various city-states. Uh, maybe further to the north there are resources available there, further to the south other kinds of resources, and so these resources are flowing back and forth. There's specialization, maybe miners in certain areas or farmers in other areas, uh, herders up in the hill country, uh, maybe, the, maybe even fishermen who are selling fish into the marketplace. And so you get a whole variety of different specializations. People become dependent upon not just producing everything for themselves, but being able to trade and through commerce acquire different kinds of resources. And then imagine that a, a small group of those city-states decide that they don't want to play anymore. They don't want to be a part of the, uh, of the larger um, uh, kingdom. What do you need to do? Well, at that point in time, uh, the, the interdependency becomes threatened and therefore food supply becomes threatened or defense becomes threatened or you know whatever it may be and that inspires some people to decide to 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 get more control over the situation and that control comes through conquest if you're not going to play with us then we're going to conquer you and we're going to make you play uh, by our rules as those communities expand beyond, particularly beyond their own sort of ethnic tribal configuration so that there are people who are distinctively other, who speak different languages, have a different religion uh, perhaps, or uh, who, ha who are of different ethnic composition. That means that those people could perhaps not only become resources for labor and, and, and conquered and become slaves, but also uh, their land, their uh, agricultural resources, whatever resources they have available to them can be uh, also appropriated and maybe the people just, um, you know, maybe killed off. And so we see in a number of sort of expansive societies that, you know, warfare that, this, that, that conquers these new territories, um, the, the, 
the, the men of fighting age are oftentimes killed off. Maybe the old people are also killed off. The women are incorporated into the uh, conquering society. Young children incorporated into the conquering society. And the, 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 the farmers may be sort of kept, the, sort of the poor, and sort of incorporated into a labor regime through slavery or whatever. Or they might also be uh, sort of, you know, uh, killed off. And then new farmers brought in to be able to expand the opportunity for farming among the uh, uh, with this new newly acquired land. And so that kind of expansion was certainly documented uh, in the historical record when you would have you know the Assyrians conquer and then carry away into captivity uh, groups of people. And we see that uh, articulated in the Jewish scriptures, um, what Christians call the Old Testament. Uh, when we see that the ten tribes of Israel conquered uh, by the Assyrians and then carried off into captivity and they sort of disappear from the, the historical record. That conquest was very likely a conquest in which uh, these people were carried off into slavery and then the population replaced uh, by, the, uh, by, by the Assyrians through time. This newly acquired territory then becomes tribute paying and so the, the, the production of the new lands then, uh, a part of that is skimmed off by the, uh, by the imperial powers and tax money is sent back or tribute money is sent back uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the core of the empire. Through time, the sort of conquest by force continues, but rulers began in empires to essentially create client states. So instead of just eradicating people or you know, sort of destroying the, the upper echelons of the society, the, the emperors began to, uh, uh, to, to develop relationships, client relationships, with the existing rulers, and they essentially you know, cut a deal, essentially. We can, we can kill you off, or you can work with us. And oftentimes, the existing rulers may say, well, I mean, given the choice, uh, maybe I'll work with you. And so they began to, you know, sort of work their people, um, you know, get the productivity levels up so that they can pay the tax, they can pay the tribute, and then keep the peace. And so oftentimes, empires create a kind of order, uh, a kind of peace in some ways or another to this larger geographical area because they've conquered everyone and business likes order, business doesn't like chaos, and so the business of empire is to establish a zone in which there's as little chaos as possible. Of course, there are always people who don't like to be governed by someone else, and that would lead to you know, the development of resistance movements, of uh, revolts, of riots, uh, of all those kinds of things. And so we certainly see that as part of the, uh, the imperial story, is create an empire, expand it as large as you can, and, and the borders of those empires often come up against deserts or come up against oceans or come up against less populated areas where there aren't people to conquer and bring into the, the supply of energy to the empire and to the productive um, uh, flow of goods into the empire. So once you reach those limits, then the job of the empire is to figure out how to maintain uh, the economy and keep things going uh, in, in, in in a particular way. And so we see this among the Assyrians, and we see this among the Babylonians. Uh, we see this among the, the Persians as you know Cyrus and Darius begin to expand out of Iran and expand west and sort of gobble up all of Western Asia. Uh, we see this in Alexander the Great, that uh, Macedonian uh, great king, who then expands and 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 gets control over um, you know all of Greece, and then goes and fights the Persians, and then defeats the Persians, and then and marches his 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 conquering army into uh, in, into northern India, only to discover that there's a huge number of people there, and his army is a is a small group of people, sort of. In, engulfed in this place and his soldiers essentially say we can't fight our way into this out of this there's no way we've got to back out of here and that leads Alexander the Great ultimately to retreat and to consolidate his empire from essentially Iran parts of Iran back in to um, back into into Greece and so he get, he, he finds it he dies in, in, in the process of all of this but his his descendants create this sort of Hellenistic empire where there are three sort of geographical regions that are able to be sustaining and, and, and support themselves 
so, so that large expanse never really was held on to uh, by, uh, by these Greeks, the descendants of Alexander. And of course, that was replaced then ultimately by the Roman Empire. Uh, the Roman Republic sort of devolves into the need to have a, a strong imperial leader um, that was sort of kicked off by Julius Caesar uh, and then later sort of consolidated uh, um, uh, consolidated by the, the subsequent Roman emperors and the development then of the Pax Romana or the Peace of Rome in which Rome controls much of Western Asia, most of Northern Africa, up into Northern Europe, and as far west as, as, as Britain. And these, these, these emperors then control this vast area and yet the control of it depends on their relationship with these various client kings in these various fringe kingdoms to sort of uh, work that control. And so we see all, all kinds of things, like for instance in the, in the, the Christian scriptures you see uh, Herod the Great in the New Testament, you know, who's a Roman client. He's, he's trying to work a deal, sort of like keep the people safe, fish, by you know keeping control over them, keeping the taxes collected, uh, sending the tribute back to Rome, um, and keeping his own skin, uh, or keeping keeping himself alive and his family alive, and keeping himself kind of up in the midstream of the wealth flow, so he can skim some off. And that sort of skim of the economy by these hierarchical leaders is a big component of the development of these uh, these empires as well. And so there were a few questions. That's just sort of a, a big story there uh, in, in general terms. There were a few questions that, that, that emerged from your comments, um, and that would be a few such as, um, are empires simply made by charismatic leaders like Alexander the Great, or are there other factors uh, such as location involved? I think that came from, uh, from Will. And I would, I would like to say that, you know, there, that, that in history, in the in the in the writing of history, uh, we tend to, to to be as professional historians. We tend to to, to not want there to, to to suggest that there's only one cause. So monocausation is really uh, uh, not the best place to stand on. So you wouldn't say there's one reason why this happened. We certainly recognize that there's a big context, and so I would say that. Empires oftentimes are founded by some sort of charismatic leader who can unite a bunch of people together, whether it's an army or whether it's you know politically a larger group of of, uh, of of client states or something like that. Somebody who can sort of cast a vision for that, but there's no way that any charismatic leader can do that without the context for it. And so there has to be you know the networks of trade, the the, the systems of uh, of 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 commerce in place that would make it even viable or even a good idea to try to unite a bunch of geographic areas. And so the resources have to be in place. Uh, there has to be a way to sort of travel across the distance without a lot of impediment. So these empires tend to exist in in areas where um, where roads can be built and, and people and goods can travel pretty efficiently across the landscape uh, when it gets really difficult to to move across the landscape, really, really hard to do that. Climbing high mountains, going through dense forests, and those sorts of things, that tends to become sort of a fringe zone for the empire. So geography matters a lot. Uh, leadership matters a lot. Uh, economic resource availability matters a lot. Um, and then people who are willing to, um, to, to submit to a, uh, a larger political system uh, who are you know who who either are, the independently minded people are eradicated, killed off, or, or or people just say you know this this is probably a good idea uh, to actually work together and collaborate and build something bigger, um, and so even that spirit is necessary in order to get enough allies, uh, enough you know people who are on board with uh, making this sort of large political unit happen. So all of those things have to to go into. The construction of an empire. Um, somebody asked, um, you know, can there be an empire without inequality? And I would say no. Uh, the, the, the function of empire with its hierarchical system, uh, sort of an emperor at the top, uh, 
a sort of a cast of advisors around the emperor, the sort of the imperial court, uh, these client kings or these client leaders who are harnessing the, the activity of the people, um, conquering armies, all of those sorts of things just create all kinds of inequality, both the hierarchical inequality, but also, you know, conquering new territories means that you're depriving some people of their ability to govern themselves. That's a kind of inequality. You're saying to them, you can't have all the, 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 the goods that you produce, all the production of your farms, all of the production. You've got to pay taxes or, you know, we're just going to come take it from you. That creates inequality. Oftentimes, conquered peoples are deprived of their uh, of their personal freedom, they're made into slaves. They have no control over their own lives anymore. Um, and as a result of that, well, I mean that's inequality. And empires do that thing. There's no such thing as I, I, I've never seen any example, and I don't believe there's any such thing. But if you know something, put it down in the comments. Uh, I'd love to know more about it. Of sort of a, a an equitable empire that's benevolent and good and makes things good for everyone involved. So I would say, can there be an, uh, is inequality just a part of an empire? Yes, I believe it is. Um, let's see, uh, how do people of different ethnic identities fare within empires? I think that goes back to the uh, notion of inequality, some of the things I just talked about. People of different ethnicities tend to not fare well inside empires. Typically in these ancient empires, there's a dominant ethnicity, a dominant um, tribe that, that, that organizes the empire. Um, the, the emperor and the, the court and the, the, lead, the generals of the army uh, tend to be uh, of one particular ethnic group and they conquer others and the others are lesser than. And as a result of that, people don't fare well in the... Uh, uh, if you're not part of the dominant ethnic group, if you're not part of the dominant tribe. That said, oftentimes empires fall when that dominant tribe loses a hold on important kinds of uh, uh, positions. So, for instance, the Roman Empire began to incorporate generals into the army that were not Romans, that were not Italians. They were, in fact, Germanic peoples or others, and they were very competent, very great generals. Um, and what that leads to over time is this sort of sense of like, well, now I'm a barbarian. That was what the Romans called these people who were not, not Italian. Um, I'm a barbarian. You think less of me for being a barbarian. And yet I'm the person that's leading the army that's keeping this empire around. Maybe I should just take my army and carve out my own kingdom and be dispense with you because, you know, we're, we're great. And as a result of that, you see the, the, the breakdown of the Roman Empire resulting from that very sort of thing. Last question, uh, and that is the question of, are there empires today? And absolutely there are. Uh, empires have been a, a very consistent kind of political order uh, since you know 2500 BC all the way up until today. And probably the best known empire for you uh, my students, is the empire that you live in, the United States. The United States is certainly an empire. Uh, it controls possessions uh, that, are in, that are included in an entire continent of states, of individual states that have chosen, perhaps, and sometimes not so chosen to be a part of this larger empire. It controls possessions that aren't states. Think of Puerto Rico. Think of the islands in the Pacific Ocean that are territories or possessions of the United States. That's certainly a mark of empire. Um, the, uh, then, then there's a kind of thing that we call neo-imperialism or neo-colonialism, in which the United States exerts a lot of economic power over client states that aren't really incorporated in, but the U.S. gets to call the shots in various ways because it controls the economy, because it has a really large military. Uh, and so the United States is an empire. We can claim not to be an empire. We can say, oh, well, we're democratic, and you know, therefore we can't, couldn't be an empire. But no, the United States is an empire. The Soviet Union uh, of the, the Cold War period, certainly an empire. Um, and there are, you know, examples of that that then start going back through the earlier part of the 20th century. They go back, certainly Great Britain, 
uh, a great empire. And so there have been empires very, very much in the modern period of time as well. And so that's something to be aware of. That's something to know about is that, you know, empires are alive and well today. We happen to be citizens of one of those empires. Uh, for good, for bad, sure, uh, both. And so we just need to be aware of that. So empires have been around for a very long time. Empires are matters of, of political scale. And so, you know, you start out with a little city-state, and then you can expand that into much larger and larger territory. That expansion tends to happen through conquest, at least at some point. Uh, and then as, as the empire reaches sort of the expanse of its ability to hold itself together, it reaches perhaps a period of time where things kind of are steady. And then later it begins to collapse as leadership, as resources, as, uh, as military specialization, all of those sorts of things aren't able to keep it together against the forces, perhaps internal, of people who are resistant to being told what to do, or maybe external forces of a larger or more powerful or more aggressive people begin to look to this particular place and see it as opportunity to gain control, power over its over trade resources and those sorts of things. So I hope that gives you some insight into this, uh, into sort of the general features of ancient empires as well as modern empires. And I will see you uh, next week and answer some questions um, about, about ancient religions. But if you would like, uh, certainly you can hit the, 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 the like button. Uh, and you can subscribe and you'll get this automated, you know, notification on your YouTube saying that, you know, a video is available. That would be great. So, you know, you know that comes out instead of waiting for a, an announcement uh, of that. Also, uh, if you've got questions or comments about this particular uh, session, put them in the comments down below and uh, I'll answer them there. So thanks for being with me. Look forward to being with you next time as we look at some ancient and classical uh, religions in world history. Thank you very much.